Hello and welcome to the lecture for introductory psychology on evolutionary theory. Now you might notice that this is not in the book. This is something that I added extra. It's because we're about to go into the biological side of introductory psychology and along with that really what I feel there should be a background in is evolutionary theory. Just a brief background into it. Uh, You've heard me talk, if you watch the introduction lecture, that I am a big proponent of evolutionary theory, especially when it comes to mapping human behavior. It, evolutionary theory is, is a very bio-heavy theory. It's based in biology. And through it, you can explain a lot of biology and behavior in animals, but you can also explain behavior in humans using it just not as clearly in all cases but we'll come back to that i just wanted to add this before we got into the biological side just add in a bit of what is evolutionary theory many of you are bio majors this you should have already heard this you should know this really well but for those that aren't bio majors maybe this is the first time you're hearing some of this so in this set of slides, we are going to first define evolution. Then we are going to look briefly at Darwin. Uh, if I was teaching a class with more evolution in it, I'd probably put in um, a video of Darwin. There's a very good video out there that, that shows his voyages on the Beagle and how he came up with evolution by natural selection. But for the purposes of this, we're just going to briefly talk about Darwin. We're going to then look at what is evolution by natural selection, talk about a few misunderstandings with evolution, and end with sexual selection. There are more things I could include in here. could include genetics, so we're going to get some of that in the bio in the next chapter. I could include artificial selection, but I don't think that's needed for in here. And I could even include things like life history theory, but we'll actually come back to life history theory when we're talking about developmental psychology and bring that back up. You may have already heard me use that term in a different set of slides. So now we have to ask the question, what is evolution? And if I had you in class, I'd ask you all to give me your opinion on what is evolution. And here's the thing. Evolution just refers to change over time. So most people confuse evolution with evolution in living things. And now we're going to get in just a minute to evolution in living things. But when we talk, we just use the term evolution. We have to boil that down to just change over time. That's why you can have evolution in politics. You can have evolution in uh, how things are manufactured, stuff like that. Evolution doesn't have to just refer to living things, even though that's the way we we've come to commonly associate it with. Now, let's look instead at evolution in living things. So evolution in living things refers to the change over time in the structures of living things. So even scientists before Darwin, thousands of years ago, people knew that evolution occurred in living things. You, you can go back to times of Aristotle and look at the writings then and see that that many of the po popular philosophers even acknowledge that living things changed over time. It, it isn't that evolution occurs in living things that was really up for debate. It was how that change over time occurred. And this is where I also say I have to put out there that evolution is not concerned with the origin of life. That is more chemistry, physics, that domain, or metaphysics if you want to get into it. But evolution is referring to the change in structures over time. So there you do get the origin of species, not the origin of life, the origin of species, how species evolve from other species. Now, as I said, many uh, geologists, embryologists, uh, even philosophers, biologists believed at the time that evolution occurred. One of those popular theories, one of the most popular theories uh, 
prior to Darwin was Lamarckian evolution. So Lamarck basically said that uh, individuals inherited characteristics from their parents, but he had a big emphasis on acquired characteristics. So characteristics that people acquire in their lifetime, that is what they pass on to their children. Uh, so looking at it, you see up here on the right where you get this uh, Lamarck's giraffe. So his, his basic view of evolution was that you had this giraffe here, this giraffe stretched its neck, stretched its neck more, and then through that stretching, the neck became progressively longer, and that was then passed on to the offspring. Through, through the giraffe straining and stretching its neck, that was passed on to the offspring. However, we, we now know, and even at the time, they, they generally knew that most acquired characteristics are not passed on. So Lamarckian evolution didn't work. However, he was on the right track. He was on the right track because there is this concept of characteristics being passed on, just not acquired characteristics. So characteristics of the parents are passed on. So the, along came Darwin, and he really liked Lamarck's theory, but he did think it was in, incorrect in scope, and he did think that the mechanism for it, that the an individual, whatever changes they had in their lifespan, they passed on to their offspring, he thought that mechanism was incorrect. So what he wanted to do, he wanted to explain that mechanism. What mechanism is it that was causing evolutionary change? He also wanted to know why there was purposeful structures. So the existence of purposeful structures. The eyeball is a good example. We have a purposeful structure. It's a structure that's designed to, to see in a certain way. So how do eyeballs come about within evolution? And finally, he was also interested in the origin of species. So how did species originate? How did species come to evolve out of other species? Now, this is where I'd show you a video. Darwin himself, he was, he, he was a third generation physician. So his father was a physician, his grandfather was a physician. So it was very bio heavy. They, they, he grew up in an environment where he learned about biological structures of people. His father was also a horse breeder. So he, he got some knowledge there about breeding of horses, breeding of animals. But when Darwin went to go to school to be a physician, he basically couldn't stand the sight of blood. His first surgery he went in, and you gotta remember at the time that there wasn't painkillers, there wasn't, you didn't put people under when you did surgeries. So there, the people are writhing on the table as they're tied down being cut open for surgeries and Darwin just couldn't stand it and he the first surgery he went into to watch he fled it and he, he vowed never to become a physician himself he went back to school for seminary uh, decided that wasn't really for him then he went back to school again for a uh, switch to uh, a geology related field and along those lines, he was interested in insects and things like that. There was a big overlap between geology and biology. So he, he had this, just a general sense of interest in science. Uh, also at the time, you had a, a very big division in class structure. So people from certain classes were, were not expected to interact with people from other classes. And I mean, it's something now we look back on and frown on, but it was common at the time. So a, there was a ship's captain who this, he was basically uh, tasked with charting the coast of South America. So wanted to map the coast of South America. And in England at the time had to, to sail over and map that coast. Well, again, there was this class structure in place, so the captain really wasn't allowed to interact with the crew of the ship. 
So captains at the time would hire on naturalists, scientists, things like that, people who came from a similar class as themselves, but weren't necessarily part of the crew to be part of sea voyages. So the captain would have someone to socialize with. And there was this ship, the HMS Beagle, that was tasked again, like I said before, with, with charting the, the coast of South America. The captain hired on Darwin as a naturalist to basically be his social companion during this voyage. Darwin's also had a job. He was he would do things like go on shore and chart some of the things he found, like skeletons and animals, and basically different things that he found from that. Uh, he found Darwin found lots of things during this voyage, uh, but the key came when they got to the Galapagos, which is off from the western coast of northern South America. And the, the Galapagos are a series of islands. And on these islands, he found some very interesting things. Like he found birds that looked very different from each other that were on different. Each island had distinct species of birds. Each island had distinct species of tortoises. And really, this was like this first clue. So changing slides. Darwin got to some clues to evolution. One of the first ones, the w clues, was that those finches that I just talked about. So Darwin's famous finches, um, basically, Darwin brought back in instances, individuals from each of these different species of finches. He thought they were completely different species of birds, not related at all. They didn't look much alike. You see pictures of four of them in the top right up here. So he, they, these really didn't look much alike. And he went to a biologist who specialized in birds. And this biologist told him these were all different species of finch. So they were actually related. They were just different species. They looked different, but they were all different types of finches. So these are different species that had a common ancestor. They, they had some common ancestor, that, but what was it that caused uh, them to differentiate and he thought back to these different islands and each of these different islands had different habitats they had different some had nuts they they had more nuts and seeds that were hard and they required this big beak to break into some had flowers and they they to get the the stuff out of the flowers it required longer beaks to get into so what he found is is that the islands that had those flowers it had the birds like what you see in the bottom right. Whereas the islands that had nuts and seeds, it was like the ones on the top left. So each different species of finch was adapted to the environment on the island he found them on. Darwin also, again, like I said, he, his father was a horse breeder. He knew from horse breeding and breeders have known for again, thousands of years this that some characteristics from parents are passed on to offspring if you have a characteristic that you like in in in, in the species you want and you you find that characteristic in an individual you breed that individual because their offspring are more likely to have that characteristic so again you've got this this great variation going on that he found out in the finches you've got characteristics passed on to offspring and uh, the, the last thing, the last key component that, that came along was he, he read some works, work by Malthus. And Malthus had said that more organisms are produced than can survive. This, this, there's a struggle for existence. Darwin actually did some math here and found out that if a female elephant began reproducing at the age of 30 and had one calf every only 10 years, so having six calves in total, over 500 years later, she would have 15 million descendants. The, by the fact that we know the world isn't overrun by elephants, the world isn't overrun by any species. It, 
if, if we looked at it in species that reproduce faster or have more offspring, it would be even crazier. You look at a spider that has um, hundreds, uh, lays hundreds of eggs. If every one of those eggs turned into an adult spider that laid hundreds of eggs, within just a dozen years, the world would just be completely overrun with spiders. So there is this struggle for existence along the lines of more offspring are produced than can survive. And these three things come together. So let's talk about evolution by natural selection now. So evolution by natural selection, you have a variability that exists, variance. That is that variability that, that Darwin found. He was talking, I talked on the previous slide about variability between different species, but even within individuals, there's variability. You, two different individuals, unless they're identical twins, are not going to be identical. So there is variability between different individuals. If one, if two different birds, one has a slightly longer beak than the other, and one has a slightly shorter, and to get food, the one that's got a slightly longer beak is, is uh, going to be able to get more food, then that's going to be an advantage. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the first key step is that variability exists. The next is heredity, that variability is passed on from parents to offspring. It's not acquired variability, even though there's a little bit of that going on, but that's beyond the scope of what we're going to get to. We're not going to really talk about epigenetics in here, but typically variability is only passed on that, that is part of genetic code, not acquired variability. But variability that you have these characteristics that you have from birth, from your genes, can be passed on. So, heredity. And then finally, some variants survive and reproduce better than others. That is selection. This is where I was just kind of getting ahead of myself talking about birds. That bird that had the slightly longer beak, so the variants, that variance allows them to survive and reproduce better than others. So the one with the slightly longer beak can survive better than the one with the shorter beak. Therefore, that they're more likely to survive, then they are more likely to pass on those genes of having a longer beak, passing on that through heredity. So when all three conditions are met, some variants in, increase in, in frequency and some decrease in frequency depending on whether they help aid in survival and reproduction better. The variants that tend to aid in survival and reproduction increase in frequency. The ones that hinder survival and reproduction decrease in frequency. And when all three of these come together, the change in frequency of particular variants in a population due to inheritance and selection is called evolution by natural selection. Long way to say evolution by natural selection is basically where characteristics, inherited characteristics that aid in survival, aid in reproduction, increase in frequency, ones that hinder or don't aid as well as others, decrease in frequency. This is the short version of evolution by natural selection. Uh, this is one of those concepts that, that is very easy to just explain briefly, but is very complex and, and has many things that go into it and is a, a very difficult concept to master. And another thing I'll just say real quick here, because one of the things, and, and I actually will come back to this at times, but one of the things that I always like to talk about when I'm talking about evolution by natural selection, and that is we've got survive and we've got reproduce. We've got two different things here when we're talking about evolution by natural selection. We've got survive and reproduce. One of these is actually more important than the other. And it's not the one most people think. Most people think survival is more important, but it's actually reproduction that's more important. Survival is still important. I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong there. Don't misquote me. Survival is still very important when it comes to evolution. But actually what's more important is reproduction. A individual that 
survives for a million years but never reproduces is never going to have heredity. They're never going to pass on their genes. Therefore, evolution by natural selection doesn't work on them. An individual that only survives for one hour but reproduces and reproduces well, then evolution is working on them. So in that case, reproduction is what's important. Survival is important to the extent that it gets you to reproduction. But reproduction is what's important, the most important when it comes to evolution by natural selection. And that's why we'll come back to later. We'll talk about one of the, the subcategories of evolution, which is called sexual selection, and why that's such a big deal and why that became so prevalent and why before Darwin came up with sexual selection, it actually, his, his theory had holes in it. And that is what filled the holes in. So if I ever ask you a question, what's more important, survival or reproduction, when it comes to evolution by natural selection, it's reproduction. And that's why when you hear that term survival of the fittest, it makes evolutionary theorists just want to facepalm because it's not survi about survival as much as it is about reproduction. Should be reproduction of the fittest if you want to say anything, but that's even bad and cringy. So. Okay, now let's transition into some of the common misunderstandings about evolutionary theory. I'm not going to harp on this too much. I just want to talk about them briefly. Um, one of the big things that's typically said is that when we talk about evolution, we're talking by bio biological side. And then if we're talking that, then we say that the environment's unimportant, that behavior is genetically determined. And I'm not getting into determinism versus free will. I'm just getting into uh, genes versus environment. And I've already said earlier in a previous set of slides that they're both important. But let's look here because some people say that, that by following evolutionary theory, somebody is, is saying that the environment's unimportant. Well, that's not true. Evolutionary theory is a very interactionist uh, theory. It's a very interactionist framework that is that both the genes, these genetically based predispositions and adaptations are and environment, the environmental triggers are what's important. You see two things here on this slide. On the left, you've got calluses. Uh, this is where, again, genes and environment are important. These calluses that you have here and all over the hands they are important because, or both the genes and environment are important because this person and just about everyone have a genetic predisposition, a genetic code to form calluses, but it takes environmental triggers like working with your hands, weightlifting, doing a sport with your hands, digging, stuff like that. It takes working with your hands for these calluses to form. So it's an interaction between the genes and the environment. Over on the right here, you see the tan, uh, the tan to have the and skin tone in general is there is a genetic predisposition to have a skin tone. You, you're, you're genetically predisposed, predisposed to have a skin tone that's within a range, but then you need the environment, the exposure to the sun or lack of exposure to the sun to get specific skin tone that you have. And I'll come back to it on the next slide, even that with the, the sunscreen that's being applied. Okay, next slide is related to the first one. The first one is that if it's, it's determinism, the next or biological determinism in a such a sense. The next one is, is if it's evolutionary, we can't change it. Well, since the genes and environment interact, we can change our outcomes, our behaviors, our responses by altering the environment. So you see here on the left, a hand without calluses. That is because this individual didn't do things that would have re re resulted in calluses. The, the same with the previous one. If you want calluses, you do things that result in calluses and you can get calluses. Over here on the right, you see an individual that has pale skin. Uh, the pale skin is a result of 
either sunscreen or staying out of the sun. So the the in the skin again as pale as it is, you still have a genetic limits upper and lower limits of skin tone which we'll actually talk about in a couple more slides but you have some genetic limits on skin tone but you can manipulate that by manipulating the environment you're in such as using sunscreen or staying out of the sun to be paler or going out in the sun using less sunscreen to be darker and what it comes down to here and i love this 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 concept and it's why I'm such a strong proponent of evolutionary theory and why I teach it in just about every class I, I teach because the better we understand our evolved psychological mechanisms and how they act and interact with the environment the greater our power to cre create desirable outcomes in humans and this works in behaviors in all different things this is how we can uh, reduce things like racism by better understanding the mechanisms that we have in our head these predispositions that we have based on bio biology and genes and how they interact with the environment the better we can control and reduce adverse behaviors like racism and increase beneficial behaviors like helping and charity next one and i'm going to talk about this one for a little while and that is the current mechanisms are optimally designed this is a misunderstanding a misconception what we actually know is that no our current mechanisms what they actually represent is adaptations to past environments so our current environment if it differs substantially not always but if it differs substantially from our previous ones these mechanisms we have aren't necessarily going to be useful anymore and I'll even come into and talk about some of these how uh, it might not even be due to environmental mismatch but it might be due to other reasons so this is a of the we're gonna have three different things were optimally designed so a our, our mechanisms are not optimally designed because of what's called environmental mismatch uh, there's a term called EEA that's our error of environmental adaptiveness you don't have to know that or memorize it just know that e the EEA is when behaviors evolved so these behaviors didn't evolve in the last week the last month the last year even the last few generations they might they're continually evolving over generations but the most of the behaviors we have evolved over the last few hundred thousand to few million years so these are behaviors that evolved in a environment that is very different than our rapidly changing modern environment that involves cities and technology and electronics that weren't around when these behaviors evolved so we get a couple things that's going on here and you kind of see what i'm talking about on the bottom right where you have original environment uh, that's where the trait it may be neutral or, or advantageous uh, the environment changes and we get a mismatch in uh, so sometimes we'll you'll get behaviors that'll decline over after that but it's not something that happens overnight so let's look at two of these pictures here um, the one on the left is the one I love the most it's the one I always talk about and that's candy sugar there's a very big environmental mismatch going on there that is that when our desire to eat sugars and carbs evolved it was in an environment that was very different than the environment we're in now it was when we were in an environment where there wasn't readily available large quantities of sugars and carbs like there is now so it we evolved this humans evolved this desire strong desire for sugars because sugars would have been beneficial when you could get sugar when you could get these carby foods high carb foods you you would want to eat them because they would have been high calorie they would have been very beneficial in an environment where food might have been scarce however we're in an environment now where you can go down to the corner store and get sugar get candy and as a result you can uh 
this strong desire for sugar, if we listen to this strong desire over and over again, we end up being obese. We end up getting, getting diabetes. We end up with adverse outcomes. So this environmental mismatch between when we evolved our desire for sugar and our modern environment where sugar is everywhere resulted in results in adverse mechanisms, adverse adaptations. On the right here, you see aggression. Aggression is one of those. Again, we got an environmental mismatch. In our evolutionary past, it might have been beneficial to be aggressive. Uh, being more aggressive might have gained resources, might have gained uh, opportunities for reproduction, those types of things. Whereas in our modern environment, aggression is basically morally frowned upon. So acts of aggression now actually typically have the opposite effect. So we evolved the mechanisms for aggression in an environment where it was beneficial and we continue to be aggressive even now in an environment where it is detrimental. Okay, so let's look at the second for current mechanisms are optimally designed. That is not all that we, we should look at. Um, the, the, and it's, again, it's the misconception that current mechanisms are optimally designed because they're not optimally designed. The, the second evidence for that is that all adaptations have costs, so not all features can be optimized. Um, on the left here, you see a book called Living Color. It's by Nina Jablonski. She is a anthropologist uh, from Penn State University that studies the basically the evolution of skin color and basically and then the social and biological meanings of that. But what it comes down to here is is that because mechanisms any adaptation we have, it's a better way to say it, any adaptation we have is going to have costs and benefits. Very few adaptations just come with benefits. Very few adaptations that are, that are selected for come with just benefits. They come with costs as well. And the reason I, I am talking about skin tone here is because skin tone is a very good uh, example of that. That is that skin tone, darker skin tone specifically, has a very big advantage. That very big advantage is it protects us from the sun. The sun has a har harmful light that, that causes cancer. And by having a darker skin tone, it reduces your chances of getting cancer from the sun. So it, it is very beneficial. It, and you see this in, in example here in the girl on the left she has very dark skin she has a she's going to have a lower chance of getting cancer from being out in the sun so there are benefits to dark skin tone however there are costs to dark skin tone and, and we'll go conversely with the light skin tone in just a second but there are costs to dark skin tone that is that we need vitamin D to survive and we get vitamin D by the sun from basically we absorb it from the sun. However, the darker skin tone makes it harder to absorb the vitamin D. So you get the benefit of lower cancer as well as some other benefits and the main cost of, uh, of lower vitamin D absorption. The girl on the right here, she gets the benefit of greater vitamin D absorption, but the cost of greater risk of cancer. So we then have to ask, well, why don't we all have darker colored skin? Why don't we all have lighter colored skin? Why is there variance in color of skin? And that is because these different skin tones evolved in environments where it would have been beneficial to have one skin tone or the other. The girl on the left, this is a from an involved environment where there was lots of sun, large quantities of sun. And even large quantities of sun, even with darker skin tone, you, you can still absorb vitamin D by being in the sun more. So in environments where there's more sun, closer to the equator, uh, 
more environments where there's less trees, where there's less clouds, where there's just more time in the sun, you're going to get this, like on the left, darker skin tone. Whereas environments farther from the equator, where there is less sun, where there is less opportunity to absorb vitamin D, for, or less opportunity to absorb vitamin D because there's less time in the sun, you get these lighter skin tones like you see here and typically you get in the environments where this red hair green eye evolved green eyes evolved is northern Europe um, or where you get the light skin blonde hair so you get Ireland northern Europe places like that where they have less time in the Sun uh, the there's jokes about Ireland that you never see this or the, that the the three days you see the sun because it's just always overcast as well as if you ever look at a map Ireland is way north in the grand scheme of things so they just have less daylight in general so you get these benefits and costs and the environments that they evolve in as a result however now we go back to that environmental mismatch we were talking about because now we have people being able to travel so we have people with darker skin environment in environments where uh, lighter skin would be more beneficial we have people with lighter skin in, in environments where darker skin would be more beneficial we have both in environments where we're inside all the time so that's an environmental mismatch there uh, it just it, it's where these costs and benefits of different features there there's costs and benefits so we evolve where costs and benefits would be optimized and now we have an environmental mismatch on top of that yeah now let's get to the third one that is that natural selection does not have foresight so see here natural selection doesn't have foresight so it because of that it often just finds the best solution to a problem given the the options it has and there's two things going on with this one first off it, it finds the best solution to a problem based on the alternatives it has so because of that it, it can't create adaptations it can't create variance that doesn't exist so even if the optimal the ideal mechanism would be one thing if evolution never gives it the option or the opportunity to go in that direction then it's never going to go in that direction the other thing is is the foresight problem here and that is that evolution is evolving for the current environment not for the future environment it doesn't give an organism what it needs to survive it gives an organism what sir what was useful for survival when that behavior evolved let's look at a couple examples of that first is the human eye and just not just the human eye the vertebrate eye so the vertebrate eye all vertebrates all things with with backbones have this type of eye that it, some of them have variations on it some of them have lost it but basically all things with backbones have this eye and that is the the eye that that we have as humans is basically inside out um, the optic nerve leaves the eye and where it leaves the eye there's a hole what that ends up resulting in is a blind spot so some animals have bigger blind spots than others in humans we have a blind spot off to the side it's not that big of a deal but it is a blind spot that exists why is that blind spot not been selected out in, in vertebrates and mainly because again it's giving it giving vertebrates any individual the the best of possible alternatives and it, can't, it hasn't been selected out because no better alternative has been presented however in the eyes of some mollusks like squids and octopus which you find or octopi octopus is octopi both are technically correct um what you find is is that the retina is in front of the optic nerve and they don't have a blind spot so when the eye evolved in these mollusks it evolved without this blind spot present and because it hasn't been detrimental enough to be selected against in invertebrates plus a better thing hasn't come along you, you find that it's just 
it stays invertebrates. Uh, the eye is interesting. There's eight or nine different unique evolutions of the eye that have been found in different animals throughout history. So it's it's one of those that there is definitely different versions out there. But because mechanisms are they they have to deal with what what they're given, that it's the vertebrate eye, even though it's not optimal, is the vertebra is the eye we have. The second example I'm going to give here, and this is the, the last example I'll give for this, and then I'll move on to sexual selection, is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is a fun one. So this is a nerve that supplies motor function and sensation to the larynx or the voice box. So what it does is it descends from the back of the brain here to the throat here. However, it goes all the way down around the aortic arch. So it goes all the way down below the aortic arch before it comes back up. Uh, and what is going on here? Well, actually, in fish, one of our ancestors, or the, the fish that have a common ancestor as us, but are closer to the common ancestor in morphology, in fish, this nerve goes like this. That's because the aortic arch that you see here in this aortic arch is actually up here. So in fish, it still goes around the aortic arch. It just is a, this nerve is a very short nerve. In mammals, where the chest cavity evolved and descended down from the throat, uh, and this aortic arch descended into the chest cavity, the nerve that went around this, it, again, it best, it, the, the best mechanism, the best variation available was just to continue to go around that the aortic arch. There wasn't any variations that evolved that it went straight between. So it continued to go on down through around the aortic arch as things evolved longer. Uh, this is even more absurd when you look at uh, vertebrates with long necks, like giraffe here where it comes all the way down and back up or even when we look at some things like the brontosaurus where it went all the way down like this and all the way back up this is definitely not optimally designed optimally designed would have been this tiny little thing right there in blue instead it went all the way down in the chest cavity and all the way back up uh, the way i equate this is is it's like driving from detroit to ann arbor by way of toledo so you see the red line is Detroit to Ann Arbor, but instead going down for, through Toledo first. So, and again, why is this occurring? It's occurring because there wasn't a variant that existed where, or at least a variant that existed where it was beneficial enough to be selected for. So there's a lot that goes into evolution. There's a lot of misconceptions out there. And if you're interested, and those are their bio majors, you've heard all this before, but if you're interested, I really strongly suggest looking into it. It's, it's some really interesting stuff. All right, the last thing I'm gonna talk about, these slides ended up longer than I intended. Anytime I get talking about evolution, I get long-winded and talk longer than I intended. I just wanna bring up sexual selection. So um, the reason I bring this up is because prior to sexual selection, Darwin actually had nightmares about uh, the peacock's tail. That is because the peacock's tail really it goes against evolution by natural selection. That is, the peacock's tail is not something that benefits it in survival, survival specifically. I'll come back to the, the why I'm bring, leaving out reproduction in a second. But the peacock's tail does not aid it in survival. It's, it's vulnerable to parasites, predators will latch onto it and catch the bird as a result. So it's just one of those things that it, it's really a hindrance to survival. And prior to coming up with sexual selection, which happened about 15 years after Darwin came up with natural selection, and, and is Darwin was focused on survival as the mechanism. But what really kind of brought evolution by natural selection together into cohesive theory we have today is the advent of sexual selection and that is that 
the anything that aids or gives an advantage to an individual over others in exclusive relation to reproduction, even if it has a cost in survival, will be selected for. So this is kind of where going back to where that survival and reproduction where reproduction is more important. So the peacock's tail, the reason the peacock's tail is, is selected for is because it aids the peacock in reproduction, even if it imposes a survival cost. And actually one of the reasons it aids it in reproduction is because it imposes a survival cost. It's something that signals to a peahen, a female, that even though he's got this giant tail, he still is able to survive and resist parasites and survive predators. So because he's able to survive, he's strong enough to, to survive, then his offspring will be strong enough to survive as well. There's more that goes into it than that, but that's the basics of it. Those three conditions of, of natural selection still must be met met there must be variance there must be heredity and there must be selection it's just that in sexual selection the variance that the variance that increase survival sorry the variance that increase reproduction even if they hinder survival are selected for because they are variants that will get them selected for reproduction So just in review, like I said, I got a little bit long-winded there, but we talked about evolution, talked a little bit about Darwin, uh, looked at evolution by natural selection, uh, looked at some of the common misunderstandings and what's going on with those and, and kind of some of the ways to counter those, and finished up with sexual selection and how that kind of ties it in together. There's so much more with evolution. I could talk about it an entire semester if I wanted to. So if you're more, if you're interested in more, go and look into that. Thanks. Come on back.